Major funding for Carolina Business Review is provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, leading up to and certainly central to the election year, rhetoric has been the topic of education. In fact, for the last few weeks, we have included more than just a passing reference to it in our discussions here on this program, and it will not change this week. Welcome again to the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William, and this time on CBR, we will drill a little deeper into what many call the most important investment we can make in our economy, but more importantly and more broadly, in ourselves and our community. Joining us later, the new president at Presbyterian College in South Carolina, Claude Lilly. Major funding also by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded November 2nd, 2012. On this week's program, Dr. Bill Anderson of MechEd, Dr. Mary Lynn Calhoun of the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, and special guest, Dr. Claude Lilly, president of Presbyterian College. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome to our program. Uh, uh, Bill, good to have you here. Mary Lynn, nice to see you. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Uh, this topic of education, you know, here, here we are, <laughs> thankfully, past the election cycle. And, you know, so much has gone on in this presidential election. I think it's fair to say this has probably been a two-year process now. They've been uh -huh. running for office now for two years and finally passed it. But, uh, it, it, Bill, let me start with you. Uh, during... during uh, uh, Political rhetoric, election year rhetoric, and the distortion of election gravitational fields. What has been distorted about really what is at the core of education, the challenges we have? What's been lost? Well, being a former teacher and a former principal, I am most concerned about it seems as though many have forgotten the value of teachers. And I think that teachers have somehow been demonized somehow. Te we're not valuing uh, the importance of teachers. Uh, we continue to raise uh, class sizes. Teacher salaries stay the same. And when we look at national retention rates, it's frightening, actually, how many teachers leave the profession within five years. And you're, Mary Lynn, you're, you're, you're outputting teachers in your program. Exactly. Is that number of teachers going down, going up, staying the same over the last decade? Uh, the need for teachers is, is growing, particularly in states with uh, growing populations. And the number of, of fully qualified graduates who are prepared to be teachers doesn't reach that gap in lots of parts of the country. Why, tell me why that is. Um, there are wonderful young people and wonderful career changers who are making the commitment to becoming teachers. But as Dr. Anderson has noted, uh, there's, there have been some difficult conversations in the last three to four years. You mean and public you know, conversations? Public conversations that tend to focus any challenges or problems we see on education in a blame the teacher kind of mode. And the salaries are, are not adequate. We don't stack up well with our international competitors in terms of how we value and compensate teachers. And the significant budget cuts uh, that have been faced at all levels of the public sector over the past few years have made the working conditions very challenging. When, um, when there's political discourse mm -hmm. about education, those budget cuts aren't mentioned. It's we've got to get more, do more, mm -hmm. make teachers more accountable, make um, students more accountable, while the resources are being drained away 
from the schools. I would also say to you, Chris, that I don't think the conversation about education has been uh, upfront and central in this election as in some past elections. Um, I read recently that about 3% of Americans put education as a top priority in this election. In the year 2000, it was 17%. Mm -hmm. It was a much more important part of the discourse in the earlier part of this century. You know, it, 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 it occurs to me that uh, funding education is a lot like when you buy an old house and you gotta fix the plumbing and you gotta fix the electricity and you gotta fix the stuff that's not seen. In, in, in teaching, not seen for a little while, but you, you've got to spend big money on things that maybe aren't as overt. Is that maybe the case here, Bill, that we don't, that we don't see the immediate return on investment? When, if paying teachers more, making sure class sizes don't get too big, building facilities, et cetera? Uh, you know, I think that's part of it. I think class size has been a real challenge. Uh, I, I think there are some who say that if you have a great teacher, and you have 40 kids in a class, that that great teacher can get to all those students. I would disagree with that. I think that 40 students for a high school teacher is just way too many. I think once you get over 25, it really starts to become a problem. Um, so I, I do see that as a problem, but I also think that we have to make sure, and I'm talking more high school here, we have to make sure that it's relevant. Um, we don't have a large percentage of our students actually going on to the four-year colleges that we need to, and I'm convinced one of the reasons for that is, is that that's not where really all the jobs are these days, and we need to think a little bit differently. Uh, in 2011, Harvard produced that Pathways to Prosperity report that stated very clearly that the College for All mantra was actually harmful for some. And when you look at some of the European countries, they do a much better job of providing other opportunities for students while they're still in school with some workplace learning opportunities uh, that can lead to some internships and possible apprenticeships. And I think that's also a big need, that we have kind of been stuck in an old model and we haven't changed mm -hmm. with the times enough. So vis-a-vis, -vis, really you're talking the community college system in North Carolina, it's technical college system in South Carolina. I am, and many of the students who end up having that workplace learning opportunity while they're still in high school will go to the community college for a year or two and then transfer to the four-year university to finish their degree. Yeah, you know, and before we make that leap and that bridge from K through 12 to, to the higher ed, I, I want to stick with the teacher's thing for just yes, a sec sure. second here. Mary Lynn, so uh, if we throw more, more money at teachers, I, I, and, and it's oversimplifying, I understand that, but what, and it's probably going to be a tough question for you to have to answer, but what percentage of teachers shouldn't be doing that job? 10%, 5%, you know, need to be shown some other career mm -hmm. field. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I mean th there's yes. got to be a, a mix in here between paying them more and finding the ones that really are passionate about doing that. If I could encourage you to change the word throw money to invest money, <laughs> I'd be really happy about Point that. Point well taken, um, thank you. But uh, I, I think the, the, the teacher accountability, teacher evaluation world is changing. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, it's a very appropriate change. Uh, we're looking at ways to uh, examine teachers' impact on student achievement and have some tools to help with that. I, I worry that those tools are being used with a broad stroke and are not mm -hmm. nuanced enough or reliable enough to make individual decisions at this point. But they're good enough to help good teachers become better teachers. Mm -hmm. And that's a place where I would do a lot of investment as well. As in any profession, there are some people who shouldn't be doing that work. And, um, and there needs to be a way to uh, let them find another path. But I think we could invest a lot more in good teachers who can become great teachers. We've got some knowledge and some skills and some tools so to do that work. Behind the teacher, I'm assuming the principal, and I'm, this is a little leading for you because I know you're a recovering principal to some degree, and a good one. And I say that kiddingly, of course, Bill, but I'm assuming that that's probably the toughest job because you've got to support the teachers, you've got to work within the school system, and you've got parents, you've got administrative duties, you've got to be a cheerleader, and you've got to be good at all this stuff. You know, Chris, though, back to what uh, Mary Lynn was saying a moment ago, I, and I know we're talking about uh, pay for performance, and we're talking right. about if we're going to invest more money in teachers, is there going, are there going to be performance measurements in place? And I think there absolutely have to be, but it's much more than just test scores. 
uh, I believe we need to take an approach that brings in multiple measures. Uh, what is, uh, how do students evaluate their teachers? What are your co how do your colleagues evaluate your teachers? And I will tell you frankly, as a former principal, it was very frustrating sometimes when I had a uh, teacher who was not performing up to par. It was challenging to help them find another career. And I think that's, that is a challenge, but the reality is it's not just test scores. We have to look at multiple measures for our teachers. But the best teachers in a building are what make a school great. Mm -hmm. Keeping your great teachers and your young teachers who are learning their craft, supporting them, helping them learn what it takes to become a great teacher, that's also really a big part of it as well. You know, I wish, I wish we had more time to talk about, you know, some of the tough issues around parental involvement, yes. school board yes. and oversight. I mean, all of these things we, you know, we all shake our heads at, and we'll, we'll have to make the jump, though, and evolve into the higher education, and we will. We'll bring our guest on in just a moment. Stay with us, please. Next week on this program, uh, we continue the education dialogue in the chat. She is Dr. June Atkinson, and if uh, the name should ring a bell, she's been the North Carolina Superintendent of Education for some time. And then in the week following, he is the South Carolina Superintendent of Education. His name is Mick Zace, and he will be here in two weeks. Here's an interesting factoid about our special guest. We have hosted him through three different school leadership appointments over the last two decades from UNC Charlotte to Clemson, and now the 17th president of Clinton, South Carolina-based Presbyterian College. We welcome back Dr. Dr. Claude Lilly. Uh, welcome back. Thank you, Chris. President Lilly, that has a good ring to it. It has a nice ring. I'm enjoying the position, but I enjoy the other ones, too. Uh, well said, nicely said. Uh, Claude, what, what, tell me what your bucket list is for PC. What do you want to do there? How do you leave your mark? Well, I think that PC as a liberal arts school has to be into preparation, and by that I mean we prepare people for med school or law school, we prepare teachers, we have a pharmacy school. We're not, uh, we're not like a large state institution where you might be turning out a significant number of business people. We're just preparing people, and I think as long as we do that effectively, we'll be all right. Ninety percent of our students go on to grad school or have a job in six months, so it's a little different model. Oh. Question? I was going to say that's quite impressive uh, that you have so many students that go into graduate school. How do you help those students to under, uh, how do you help encourage them to go into graduate school? I don't think we have to encourage them, to be honest with you, Bill. What happens is students who are looking for that kind of environment tend to come to PC. So they really come with the attitude of, I'm going on to graduate school. I'm, in talking with a freshman, it's amazing how many said, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a teacher. So they already arrive with that mindset. So I don't, I'd love for us to take credit for developing that, uh, that mindset, but I don't think we do. Mm -hmm. um, Claudia, you, you talked about uh, these various professions uh, that, that your students are, are moving toward. Wow. Um, tell me, from your perspective, what does a, a grounding in the liberal arts do for those students who are preparing for professions? Well, as I've often said, I have three business degrees and it took me 30 years to get a liberal arts education, <laughs> which is probably about true. I think a liberal arts education gives you the ability to think critically and to understand the world around you, and that's very important. I've met with a lot of CEOs. I've never had one yet tell me that finance was the most important thing. It's always people and critical thinking and how they get along. So I think that a, a student who's at a liberal arts school is well prepared to succeed in life, and that's really our goal is to prepare them for life. So let, let, let's take this to the next uh, step here, Claude. So you've you, you got a liberal arts school. You've got, yourself, you've got quite a business background in the, in the, uh, the, the different business schools you've been dean of. Um, help us draw a line from liberal arts college, and, and, and especially in a state like South Carolina, that right. at least a fifth of the state's GDP is done in manufacturing. So how, how do you draw a line from the education that PC does to this, this push and this chat about creating jobs. W what does that look like? Well, you could take one of the smaller areas within the college, and that's physics. And 100% of our physics students who've gone on to engineering programs completed the programs. And we, had, you know, we have relationships with Clemson and Georgia Tech and Vanderbilt and USC. So we prepare people for jobs if that's the only thing that you're, being, you know, you're concerned about. But uh, again, I go back to my earlier comment. I mm -hmm. think we need to prepare people for whatever comes in life, because it's been my experience that business degrees were great, but it really has been the people challenges that have, have been the, the toughest for me. Mm -hmm. uh, 
T Tom Ross was on this program, president of the UNC system not long right. ago, and we talked a lot about the value of a four-year education. And uh, to uh, President Ross's comment, he said, you know, a lot of people shouldn't be going to a four-year college. When, when I question about the value of that education, how do you come down on that? Well, I think if you look at some of the other countries, like Germany, where they have a system where about the ninth to tenth grade, you decide whether you're going to college, mm -hmm. you're going to be a technical, you're going to a technical school. I think uh, we have to at least look at that model. We don't have to adopt it, but I agree. I don't think everybody needs to go to college. I've got a cousin who's doing incredible well as an electrician. Never went to college. He's very happy. Has a great life. Wonderful income. So I think as a society, we, we've lost this will to let people do what they want to do as opposed to saying, if you don't do it our way, you're not successful. Mm -hmm. Claude, I have a question. What advice are you giving your students that are going to become teachers? What advice are you giving them as they go into the field when we see that retention rates are so low nationally? Well, I, I've only been there three months, so I'm not sure mm -hmm. I've given them a lot of advice. Mm -hmm. I have found it interesting, though, in talking with the seniors they seem very upbeat. Now, whether that will continue when they've been out a year or two or three years, I don't know. But they know their problems out there. They realize their challenges. They know they won't be the highest paid people. Right. But they're so passionate about right. education right. that they, they really inspire me. So you, are, you're drinking out of a fire hose, basically, the last three <laughs> months, trying to, trying to catch up with a lot of things. Are, have you gotten down into the, the, the weeds of, you know, you've got a freshman class coming in this right. year. Not, not long off the, you know, the, the start of the semester. Right. Are they ready for college? Most of them are. In fact, I find that A students are probably more ready for college than I was. They, uh, if you look at the information they have, if you look at the interactions mm -hmm. they've had, it's a well-educated group of people. I'm always amazed when people say, you know, this generation is not as good as my generation. Well, sometimes I think that's, that's wishful thinking, quite frankly. Yeah, Mary Lynn. Uh, Claudia, uh, Help us understand the transition from high school to a college education. What kinds of decisions do freshmen need to make? What kinds of guidance do they need to be successful in their college years? Well, I think the critical thing is, is they have to get connected. And I think that's up to the institution, whether it's a college or university. Because so many of the young people come, they're there in part because their parents wanted them to be. It's the first time they've really been away from home. So you, you really have to nurture them and, and get them connected. Because if not, then you're, you're going to have uh, a lot of them going home and are, are flunking out. So we really focus on what we can do to retain them, make them feel, feel part of the community. That, mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. most important thing for us. And you remind know, them uh, to show up for class, ahead. right? Uh, it, uh, we like them to show up for class, too. Do they not show up for class at Presbyterian College? That's uh, amazing. They better show up for class and they'll be meeting with the president. You know, up, up the road in South Carolina from you, and I say up the road, it's a bit of a euphemism, but uh, Wingate College, uh, Dr. Right. Jerry McGee was here on the program not long ago, and said, and we're talking about uh, the, the cost of education, student tuition, uh, the loans that some of these kids uh, have to carry around after they graduate. He, he called it an unsustainable model. And he said, in fact, there are probably too many colleges out there. So not only are they expensive, but they have so many to choose from. I, this model does seem to be unsustainable. The rate of inflation at college level is, as you well know, Claude, is more than twice that of the standard rate of the CPI. So, how do schools how do schools need to band together or think differently or think together about this this spiraling cost of education how do you look at that well as i said we have programs engineering programs where people are coming to us for the first two years and going somewhere else so we feel like that's a model that i mean you have to support that model or, or society can't handle the yeah. education process i would challenge a little bit the inflationary cost what's really happened is is legislators have taken money away You've seen mm -hmm. universities and colleges mm -hmm. go back and say, well, we have to backfill that money somehow, mm -hmm. and we do it by tuition because there's no other way to do it. So I, I'm not sure it's inflationary as much as it is you, you've got the zero-sum game, and when states take away, those institutions have to go find the money. A lot, I, I don't know what the Clemson number was, you, but I know at USC it's less than 10% of their budget now comes from the state. Is that the kind of funding you're talking about? Clemson, and my budget was slightly under 10% for the college. Okay. It came from the state. Mm -hmm. Uh, not, you're nodding over there. Yeah, I, 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 to me, it, this is the discussion around public policy, and public policy does so much to shape what we're actually able to do. 
as a college president and former dean, what would your message be to lawmakers in North Carolina and South Carolina about their importance in supporting education? Well, I think long run, if the economy in any state is going to do well, you have to have assets. And the greatest asset you can have is people. Right. So to me, it's an investment. But you have to have the will to make that long run investment. Yeah. And today's society, whether it's freshmen coming in or I think adults, we tend to want instant gratification. Right. And, and that's not the way you run educational right. systems. As I've traveled around the world, right. other countries don't do it that way. Right. I see that as one of our greatest challenges. And I guess I'm asking from, for some advice as to how we help some of our local elected officials understand that. I think all you can do is get in front of them and present the situation. And it's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. You have to right. do it again and again and again until they, until they adopt that idea. Right. Some of them never will. Right. Mm -hmm. In these years of difficult economic downturn, I've been worried about kind of a segmentation and competition in the education community when competing for scarce state dollars or scarce philanthropic dollars. You know, the, the, the P-12 school system, the right. community college system, the technical schools, the universities, public, private. Um, I'm not sure that we have a coherent vision and see how one sector impacts another and how that together we, we can build a strong education community. Have you had some experience in your three months as, as president of, of building connections with other parts of the education community for the greater good? Well, in South Carolina, we have an association of independent colleges and universities, and we're already working on programs that will help each other. Because it goes back to Chris's point, it, it is a zero-sum game, and you, you can't just have everybody continue to grow. Because you're also fighting a demographic. The number of students is declining. Mm -hmm. And so when you got, when your customer, if you will, the number of customers is going down, and you're expanding what you're doing, it's pretty problematic. You better work together. So uh, let's take that one in a different direction, Claude. Sure. You've got, um, well, everybody talks about workforce development, right. um, mm -hmm. schools working more uh, closely in concert with businesses. How, how what do schools need to be doing differently to, to draw businesses more into the process of, the, of education? Well, I think I would say it a little bit differently, Chris. I'd say businesses need to be more involved. And what does that look like? How well, do we do that? For example, in other countries, businesses, if you're in Germany, they have internships for students where they, where they pay them, they draw them in. In this country, we have some paid internships, but a lot of companies don't want to pay for that talent. They don't want to train that talent. I think you're going to have to, business itself is going to have to change its model and say, we're willing to make an investment. Just as the legislature's got to make an investment, the schools have to make an investment. So at, at the end of the day, it's not just the schools trying to go out there mm -hmm. and change a model. It's got to be a, a societal model that changes. But you, I mean, you've been in boardrooms. You've been in these conversations. How do you, how do you convince a, a business, besides just being altruistic, how do you tell them, you need to have these kids coming in here. You need to have them learning in the, in the shadow of the master, so to speak. I mean, so I, I guess, what, what's the economic incentive? What's the cultural incentive? How do they need to look at this differently? But it's not about being altruistic. It, it's about making money. And you're going to succeed if you have the best talent. Worldwide, that's, that what, that's what happens. So it's not you've got to convince them that let's do something that's good. Let's do something that benefits the company and the stockholders and the board. I mean, if no other approach is taken, that's a viable approach. And so if you get those young people in there, you get a chance to look at them. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, uh, it's about it's, so, it's so refreshing to hear you say that because that's exactly what's happening in Charlotte right now with a number of our European firms. Siemens is a perfect example. Siemens understands the model of having high school students be part of these apprenticeships. They are opening up their factory to 16 and 17 year old students who are really getting excited about that work, then they go to CP for two years, then mm -hmm. they go on to engineering schools to finish. I think your point is very well made that businesses don't shouldn't look at this as charity, but they should look at this as long-term investments. And the more skin they have in the game, the better it's going to be for all of us. Uh, but, but then again, it, to your point, Claude, this is starting with a European company, at least in the Charlotte that, area. That is correct. Um, and, and getting that message across to American companies I think is our challenge right now. Uh, we're out of time. Uh, Claude, thank you for being on the program. My Congratulations. Pleasure. Thank you. Go Blue Hose. <laughs> and we didn't even talk about that one. Uh, we will talk about that again. Uh, Mary Lynn, good to have you here. Bill, nice to see you. Thanks thank for you. being here.
Uh, thank you for watching us. You can follow us at Carolina Policy on Twitter uh, or go to carolinabusinessreview.com. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health, including Presbyterian in Charlotte and Forsyth in Winston-Salem, are affiliate heart hospitals of the Cleveland Clinic, consistently ranked number one in the nation for heart care. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, proudly serving South Carolinians since 1946. Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.